So, so welcome. I think we have a, an exciting panel um, today at, at Purdue. We uh, like to do things at scale. Uh, so today we're going to talk, our, our panel is going to discuss compute and data at, at scale. How can we unleash the power of this technology? Um, I'll start by introducing uh, briefly our uh, panelists, and then we'll uh, jump in. So we have our uh, distinguished uh, visitor from Sandia National Labs, uh, Dr. Jackie Chen. She's a distinguished member of the technical staff at Sandia, a uh, member of the National Academy uh, of Engineering. She leads a group at Sandia developing uh, direct numerical simulations of fluid and combustion, and we had uh, the pleasure to uh, listen to her talk yesterday, and if you've missed it, it's available online, so please go and, and check it out. Uh, she's also a fellow of the Combustion Institute and the APS. Um, uh, the uh, next uh, panelist is uh, Carlo Scalo. He's an assistant professor of mechanical engineering here at Purdue. Um, his work is on acoustics and uh, turbulent flow, and he's the founder of a startup company called uh, Hisonic. Uh, next uh, in, in the panel is uh, Aresu uh, Ardenaki. She's an associate professor of mechanical engineering here at Purdue. Um, She's interested in uh, complex fluids and multi-phase uh, flow. Uh, she has won several awards from Society of uh, Women in Engineering. She's got a career award from the National Science Foundation and the Presidential Early Career Award uh, that President Obama uh, gave uh, her. Uh, John Poggi is our next uh, panelist. He's an associate professor of aeronautics and astronautics here at Purdue. Uh, he's interested in experimental, computational, and theoretical uh, fluid dynamics, so uh, runs the, the whole uh, range. He's a fellow of uh, ASME and the American Institute for Aero and Astronautics. And last but not least is uh, Professor Charlie Bowman. He's a uh, showwater professor of uh, electrical and computer engineering and biomedical engineering here at Purdue. His interest is in um, computational imaging and sensing, and uh, his, his group uh, developed the first commercial model-based reconstruction system for uh, medical applications for tomography, and he's a fellow of, of uh, several uh, societies. So uh, without for, further ado, let's, uh, let's get started on, on the topic, and uh, I'm going to uh, sit, and what we're going to talk about is uh, the, the opportunities and the challenges that, that present uh, because of the convergence of uh, cyber infrastructure, including high-performance computing systems, uh, communications, ability to do cloud computing, uh, data repositories, together with software that can make use of this uh, infrastructure. And, uh, 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 and what we want to see is talk about the future and the opportunities and the, and the challenges that, that this uh, presents. Um, so uh, I want to organize this in, in a few themes, and, and I'm looking forward uh, to thought-provoking uh, comments and uh, maybe disagreements and, uh, um, it, well, and, and a back and forth between the panelists. Okay? So, so let's, let's get started. The three themes, uh, roughly speaking, uh, I'd like to discuss the technology that we have today, uh, the, the, what opportunities that enables, the, the ability to compute at scale, uh, what are the challenges to democrat, democratize this technology, how we can put these tools to the hands of not academicians and uh, a few research groups, but to a large group of folks who can make use of them to benefit society, and what are the challenges in education, so, so how do use this technology to uh, uh, develop the next generation of scientists, the next generation of engineers. Um, so, so let me start briefly by saying in uh, the fastest supercomputer in the world in 1997 was ASCII Red at Sandia National Labs. I'm sure Jackie used that computer. Um, and that was the first computer to break a teraflop, okay? That's 10 to the 12 floating points operations per second. Uh, that was in 97. Today, we have teraflop power on our desktops. Um, we, we have millions of those computers uh, installed in the world. Um, 
we have the, the next level up in, in terms of, of simulations, a thousand times more powerful, took about 10 years to develop. That was the Roadrunner computer at Los Alamos, and that was in 2008. Now we have about 1,000 uh, petaflop computers in the world, and we're going to the exascale. So as the leadership computing goes to the exascale, we have 1,000 uh, or so petaflop systems and we have millions of teraflop computers. And uh, but my first uh, theme, what I'd like uh, to hear from the panel is, what opportunities does this enable in terms of compute and data, okay? So maybe we can start with Jackie. Okay, so my area of expertise is in, in combustion and turbulent reacting flows. And I think what the current, um, about 200 petaflop machines, I think Summit is the world's fastest machine on the top 500 as of a couple months ago. It's allowing us to um, enlarge the range of, dynamic range of turbulent scales that we can simulate to, and include some degree of uh, complexity in terms of multi-physics. So not only can we start to simulate um, detailed reaction kinetics that are relevant to the practical fuels that we use in in our cars and auto automotive engines and in our uh, in power plants that generate electricity. Um, but also, I think ha having that kind of capability lets us compute with extremely high fidelity um, scenarios or configurations that are relevant to both um, experimental laboratory flames as well as to, to uh, starting to become relevant to industry. So, configurations that represent processes, combustion processes in IC engines or in, in gas turbines. And so this is a really great opportunity um, to combine experimentation and high performance computing and simulation and design these numerical and physical experiments from the ground up as a, as a group collectively so that we can glean more physical insights and provide data benchmarks, uh, both computational and, and experimental, that uh, industry and students and, and folks from other institutions can use those data sets and benchmarks for validating their models or for their own purposes. So things like developing portals and gateways uh, that are accessible by the broader community and, and having access to the data as well as software tools to manipulate the data would be something that we're kind of right, you uh -huh. know, starting to do now. Excellent. So, so l let me bring Charlie for oh. a second then. Uh, can we talk about um, access to distributed computing? Not necessarily mm -hmm. the leadership type computing that, that Jackie was mentioning, but having mm -hmm. lots of powerful systems <laughs> distributed around the world that you can have access to, maybe in the, in the medical field, right. can have an impact. Yeah, sure. Um, no, I, and uh, I think, uh, uh, Purdue is actually a good example of that because, I mean, at the risk of sort of advertising some of the things we've done, we've developed this cluster computing system which is, uh, uh, which is very much democratized computing on campus by allowing uh, 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 individual faculty members to buy into a kind of an integrated cluster and really reduce their costs. So cost of computing is really crucial in terms of getting it out to users and it allows people that are non-experts to get derive a lot of benefit and we've done that with both CPU based systems and GPU systems and um, and uh, healthcare is a good example of where high performance computing com has played a huge role and will continue to play a huge, huge role and where cost is an important factor so it, you know unlimited cost is not practical in healthcare so so, uh, but uh, I think the, the community in healthcare has uh, 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 Technologies like CT and MR really bring together physicists and people who develop algorithms and computer scientists and biologists and, and uh, medical uh, experts to solve problems. And more and more they're realizing that computation is a really key piece of that. Okay? And, what they're, and what, you can see across the industry a key uh, direction is machine learning and what they call AI, which is playing a huge role and it's going to have huge computational demands and require different kinds of com computing platforms. So uh, it's definitely the case, because uh, I work closely with uh, various healthcare 
uh, commercial companies, and there's a huge push to integrate AI into uh, imaging applications in, in healthcare. And the last thing I want to leave you with is that inverse problems as opposed to forward modeling. So uh, uh, what Professor Chen's work did really was beautiful work in, in, uh, in simulation of combustion. And uh, ultimately, engineering problems are to design systems that solve problems. And y inevitably, you need to solve inverse problems, which is a, a particular interest of mine, of course. So, so uh, that's going to be, I think, another big push, how you can solve, uh, put those forward models into sort of larger computing uh, systems that solve uh, uh, system, uh, inverse problems required for sensing and design. So I guess more on the controversial side, uh, when I, when I you mentioned the explosion of computing power and computing capabilities, and that is that is that is a hardware, um, in a hardware technology that is hard to keep up with, right? And so it's overwhelming from a computer physicist side to do that. And as uh, Dr. Chen mentioned yesterday, it's hard to keep up. You need to have a team of computer scientists. It becomes a different job at some point. And and what, I think what is more um, humbling is to think of a supercomputer perhaps like the human brain. We all know, or they say, that we only use a certain percent of it. I have the feeling that our codes uh, do the same, right? So there's been a recent, um, I cannot recall the name uh, of this ETH group who re-engineered completely their codes so that they could use every single cycle of the CPU because otherwise our standard legacy codes only use maybe 20%. And for the, 80, for the, the rest, the CPUs were dormant. And so the, it is, these are very exciting times, but they're also terrifying from, from our perspective. We're not from a computer physicist's perspective. So there's a lot of power out there. There's a lot of potential. But I don't think we're tapping into it. And it's becoming almost distracting from our work, right? Because it's very hard to keep up. So in a way, it's a word of caution that I might raise here. Can I catch up on? Yeah. Um, so in some ways, I mean, to, again, to take a controversial standpoint, com supercomputers are getting worse. So for in terms of s traditional um, computational fluid dynamics techniques, um, we are seeing a, a drop off in per processing element speed. So very large computers are great for us in the sense of capturing a separation of spatial scales. You get more and more turbulent scales in a computer simulation. But we have a lot of problems that are stiff in time. And the only way to crack those problems was a faster and faster programming processing element. And modern computers are getting a bit slower. In the last few years, we've seen slower per core speed mm -hmm. um, in order to reduce the power consumption. So we need to, like Carlos said, rethink from scratch the approaches we use to make use of these, this hardware. Because we're not going to see a miracle going back to faster and faster core speeds just because uh, of this cost in terms of power. Yeah. I agree with what, yeah. uh, what you said, and something that I wanted to add as we moved from um, uh, megaflop computations from um, in, in 1970s all the way to now talking about exascale computing, what uh, also matters is talking about uh, what are the most important and toughest problems in the world that we want to tackle with. Uh, we heard about uh, healthcare, we heard about combustion and how that's related to emission and other challenges we are dealing with, uh, but there are two, two areas that I wanted to just um, uh, touch on, which exascale computing can uh, make an impact on. Uh, one would be on uh, climate uh, forecasting, prediction of hurricanes, um, air pollution, uh, ocean pollution. And the current um, models have resolutions on the order of um, 50 kilometers to 100 kilometers, where they would um, develop basically Earth's um, system models, which includes um, uh, chemistry, physics, chemical evolution, and everything together. Uh, but we now know clouds, low clouds, convection processes, um, ocean eddies, all of those would also con contribute to those uh, climate models. So it becomes important uh, to use these exascale uh, computing um, uh, powers to go to resolutions down to even uh, one kilometer or even below to include some of those effects. Uh, one other area that I wanted to mention is on uh, biology where um, Resolving the um, different scales becomes very important, going from atoms to DNA to cell to organ to organisms. And understanding these um, uh, metabolic processes, these uh, cellular processes, and uh, these complex interactions become important. It has been only a few years ago where 
um, million um, atom uh, uh, computations in, in biology being possible, even though those have been possible in material science or other areas decades um, before. And that's because we still need mathematical tools to be able to uh, include these complex processes. And just to um, add a question in that regard is that how um, uh, what we need is basically a rigorous course on graining um, to upscale these processes. Um, how are we in that regard, and uh, what are the challenges that we are facing in developing those coarse grain uh, models? Yeah, so, so it, it seems clear um, that, that we need teams of, of people, right? And the, the national labs are particularly good at these, where they can put together teams of uh, computer, th thank you, uh, computer scientists, uh, domain experts, um, you know, experiments for, for validation, and, and that's really what would allow us to solve you know, these problems that we're discussing in my field is material science, and we have the same multi-scale problems, the same time scale problems where you cannot easily parallelize time, which is what uh, John was mentioning. But there's new algorithms uh, coming up where uh, you can use statistics methods to achieve that, you know, the parallel replica approaches and whatnot. So it's really a combination of hardware, new algorithms, new ways of thinking about old problems, right? That's going to really uh, help us make use of these leadership type um, computers. But um, mo moving on maybe to the, to the second theme in terms of democratizing access to these tools, what it, um, so uh, as we have these teams, right, we have experts in computer, you know, computer scientists, uh, domain experts. Um, I'd like to think a little bit or discuss a little bit about the end users. So uh, I, I think if, if I have to do a, a self-criticism of our field, uh, we end up often being the end users of the products. And uh, the leadership uh, type computing serves a relatively small group uh, of people around the world. And we have thousands of petascale systems and, and millions of terascale teras systems that could be better utilized. Um, we all have um, smartphones, and you don't need a manual to use them, right? And it's very sophisticated technology. You don't lose files. You don't organize. Uh, you don't have to create directories by hand the way our uh, students do when they organize HPC uh, systems. So there's a whole. Uh, set of technology in the commercial set sector, even microservices, right? Netflix and a bunch of companies developing very sophisticated uh, systems that I think uh, our field uh, could benefit from and, and you know, make us better developers, better users, and also be able to transfer our technology to end users that may be, uh, maybe engineers, maybe doctors who can benefit from uh, these tools without knowing the uh, inner workings of the tool, knowing the physics and the application the same way one can drive a car without knowing the inner workings of the engine. Um, so th th thoughts on, uh, on that uh, democrat democratization of, of the tools? I yeah. 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 <laughs> so I think I completely agree with what you said. I think um, it does take a team of experts interdisciplinary experts to, to run on these material types of um, machines. But the data that's generated, um, and, and there are communities that are very much doing this already, like the climate community with the climate code, community code, are generating data that many, many people from across the world can use. And there are, are machine learning tools and AI tools that are allowing people to, to develop surrogate models or digital twin models that are far simpler and less complex and smaller and faster to run once they're trained on a, a few selective um, experimental you know, data, data sets or, or hero simulations. And so using those on, on um, more ubiquitous machines like Terascale or Petascale machines in a few years would, would open up access to the data information and allow um, much larger parametric sweeps and optimization problems that, for example, industry would care about if they're trying to design a product or, or an engine in my field. So I think having those tools and then having workflows, I mean, part of the problem with 
with sharing data has been in the past that com composing um, dynamic workflows and, and bringing the community on board only works if, if the, the software is not buggy. I mean, most people are willing to give it a, a try, but if they're mm -hmm. stuck um, with things not working as they're supposed to, they'll only do it once or twice, and then they move on mm -hmm. and give up. And so having hardened yeah. um, software tools, and there, like you said, we, there's a lot to be learned from the commercial sectors, right, uh, that are already doing that, and, and data as a service and all this right. kind of thing, and applying it to the science and um, fields is something that we need to to kind of get a get a ha better handle on. So, let, let me make a point that we're going to have questions from the audience, especially students. So start thinking about those questions. We'd like to open the door in a minute. Yeah, I just like to pick up on the comment about the machine learning because I totally agree with that. I gave uh, a talk uh, a week or two ago, and the title was um, "Fear of the Deep." which <laughs> deep learning everybody knows about. And it's, uh, it's been amazing to me, uh, very surprising, that for a lot of problems where I thought you needed highly accurate physical models, that these machine learning methods, particularly deep learning, um, can often replicate uh, performance that's uh, quality, fidelity, that's uh, comparable. And when you consider how much faster it is, then you can incorporate more effects and you can get actually better results. So in other words, you can, use a, you can basically train the, 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 data, the machine learning models with a higher fidelity model so that in practice it, gives you high, it may give you higher fidelity than a physics-based model. So uh, I mean, that's sort of all shaking out and maybe it won't quite work out that way, but I think that we uh, need to be uh, sort of cognizant of that and, and how it can be leveraged Maybe uh, where we have, as uh, you suggested, you know, very high fidelity models that run on a few computers, and maybe that data is distributed widely for use in training machine learning models. I I'm not exactly yeah. sure, but right. it just seems like this is kind of a game-changing technology. Right. And I think we're still kind of in the early days, right? And right. maybe in incorporating more physics-based um, Informed machine learning, yeah, and there's right, to constrain it, and absolutely. also take care of you know there's new met math methods to help identify rare events or right. extrema, you know, right. data out in the tails of PDFs. Absolutely. So yeah. all of that still needs to be done. I think people are still grappling with how to incorporate physics in these machine yeah. learning models, and, right. and and there's likely to be a lot of innovation in that space. Mm -hmm. To add to what um, Jackie and Charlie said, and to play um, devil's advocate here. Um, what sometimes I think about is we, we rely very heavily on machine learning techniques um, and treat um, physical processes as black box mm -hmm. and come up with surrogate model and not include any physics-based model. Are we losing our fundamental understanding of physics of more complicated processes? So I think it becomes very important to look at both aspects together as we evolve uh, newer and newer methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agree with that. To, to, to add to that, you know, machine learning basically interpolates between physical model cases that you have computed. Mm -hmm. So if you step outside the box, you've calibrated your machine learning model, your, your, your model will not be correct. And you have no idea what the error bounds are on a prediction that's outside the box. It could be anything. So machine learning in that sense is extremely dangerous. And if you use that for something critical like medical applications, I'm a little bit worried about <laughs> like but diagnosis you know, by machine learning. Society has done many extremely dangerous things. <laughs> over the years when it really was called for it. So, so why not another? Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, it's um, yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree with yeah. what you're saying, and and that's why I entitled this talk "Fear of the Deep." But the um, but it's but the, you can't, on the other hand, ignore uh, the reality. The other com comment I wanted to say is I I have a sign in my office that says "Deep learning leads to shallow thinking." So, uh, <laughs> uh, but that. Um, uh, that you know, uh, 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 ex physical science has for the last uh, you know for a long time been very experimentally oriented in much of its endeavors, and but information science has been much more kind of theoretical, analytical, and it's moving away from that towards more experimental information-based science. So, um, and that's uh, going to be something we're going to have to get going to be more comfortable with. Yeah, and I, I think if, if the data was out there, you could train these models with data that's mm -hmm. available. Uh, machine learning can actually tell you about outliers and about the model, like right. Jackie was saying, that for whatever reason is giving you the wrong values. 
And uh, it seems to me that uh, as a research community, we spend sometimes, you know, millions of dollars, uh, and all that data ends up in a PDF in a paper that's not discoverable. It's it's not uh, you cannot query it, and it really contributes very little uh, to the knowledge. And, and now we have the infrastructure to actually do this, and I think. That would allow us to train the, the, the machine learning models uh, better and also uh, assess you know, uncertainties and uh, assess where we're extrapolating and we're, uh, we're you know, in dangerous uh, territory. So, so one aspect of machine learning I'm enthusiastic about is um, using it to find surprising things in large data sets. Right. So one of my problems is I have large data sets. I had to, recently did a calculation with a restart file for a computation with 3.2 terabytes Every time step, I regenerated that, and I couldn't possibly save all the data. Right. So I have to take a guess before the computation what will be interesting and right. save that. A machine learn al learning algorithm could tell me, well, maybe you should be saving this. And that's, that's I think, is extremely valuable. That has to be in line, right? Jackie exactly. mentioned yeah. today, yeah. Uh, yesterday. Yeah, I think computational steering is a, is yeah. a really nice use of machine learning and mm -hmm. things like anomaly detection, right? Using, taking advantage of, um, Information, for example, in the higher moments beyond the mean and standard deviation might allow you to identify rare events or, yeah. you know, something yeah. that is an anomaly. Sure. And that might steer um, increased I.O. or in, in our combustion field, maybe it tells me I need to inject more fuel to, to get things to light up faster or something, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Related to the democratization of high-performance computing, there's, there's clearly a spectrum of problems you can run things that are called embarrassingly parallel. And then the end users could be, and, and which includes part of machine learning and then say Monte Carlo simulations or data mining. And then all the way to something very technical and specific that might have a lower impact such as eigenvalue solvers solved on massively parallel architectures or even DNS and LES that might seem obscure to most of the community out there. And so, so when it comes to democratization, I think there's a good chance of uh, making HPC resources more accessible and democratic if you think of cloud computing where there's that level of abstraction where the end users, which could be companies, which could be somebody on an iPhone in the future, they don't have to worry about the hardware. It's, it's, there's a layer of abstraction, but then that's one side of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, there's the computational physicists that have big data fever and they wanna dig into the hardware, they wanna optimize their code the last bit. And so I think it is important to keep in mind that there's a spectrum. There is, yeah. And right? it kind of goes along the software stack from the application yes. on down to the hardware. Yes. And, and, yeah. and, and so I think to answer the question, how and when HPC can be, will it ever be more democratic or more accessible? It depends. It, this, you need to work your way from the spectrum, from one end to the other of the spectrum. But I think we're still. Uh, I don't think that the end users um, are still, uh, there, sh there should be no reason why the iPhone couldn't make use of, of cloud computing nowadays, but I don't think we're there yet. Well, so, so I have to put a flag here for NanoHub, by the way, which uh, have about 500 simulation tools that are all web enabled uh, that, that run on HPC resources, but you can run a simulation with a few clicks from your iPhone or from your tablet. Uh, this was not planned. And I think uh, <laughs> we didn't plan for it. It was not yeah. coordinated. So can you say something about how it, was this organically grown from the, the ground this up? This grew up out of an idea that Mark Landstrom had and a, a request from a colleague who wanted to run a simulation. And he had a student put it up and, and make it available. And then a combination between Mark's idea and some folks at the National Science Foundation who had the guts to see, you know, think big. Yeah. and say this could be turned into something that's a global cyber infrastructure and now it serves uh, millions of visitors every year and uh, tens of thousands of simulation users including you know, classroom usage of really sophisticated tools but uh, that are simplified in terms of the interaction and abstracting away all the computer science, the algorithms, you, know, you need to know the physics mm -hmm. to, to execute it. Um, Let's uh, see if we have a, a question from the uh, from the audience. Uh, any any questions from uh, faculty or students? Uh, Tim. Thank you for the observation. Uh, I want to say with all the democratization of the existing worldwide, will HPC serve a real 
Uh, with democratizing technology and all throughout history, we went from three computers in the world, take up a whole room. No one could see exactly how that would change a lot of people's lives as we went along. And that trend has continued. So it's inherently hard to predict, but I'd like to kind of put it to all of your expertise and imaginations. How do you think uh, democratized petascale and maybe even someday exascale computing to everyone might open up things that are hard to imagine now, but could have a really deep impact on civilization. So we, we uh, gave each of you a crystal ball. I'd like you to <laughs> oh my God. pull it out at this <laughs> oh point. <my> and <laughs> oh boy, someone else start. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can continue. Uh, I did, if, if you look at how cloud computing is done, and I, I did some research uh, on that yesterday because I was not involved in cloud computing. I work in my own little world as a computational physicist with my cluster and, and classic clusters and architectures. And the first thing I thought without reading anything is like, oh my god, heterogeneous architectures. Uh, a computation is run a little bit in Africa, a little bit in Asia, a little bit in Japan, and then data is collected together. I don't want to deal with that. But obviously, there's a, there's a nice layer of abstraction. You don't see it. What, what is presented to you is a virtual machine. So you don't even know what's going on. It's Amazon's problem or somebody else's problem. So can excess scale reach that point where the user doesn't know, doesn't want to know, and should not know that? Probably it's already, they already do it with cloud computing, and I would have said that was impossible to do. But so the future is bright, I guess. So going back to what Tim, Tim said, I think it's great to do the democratization and, and have everyone access and uh, unleash the power of exit computing for many different aspects that we can't imagine now. But again, playing a dev devil advocate here, uh, what if also people who don't have good intentions uh, get their uh, access that and use it for things that are not good for humanity? So that's also the other side of it to think that about. That would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think security and authentication will become even more important as yeah. we move on well, into so the from, future. From a lab standpoint, I, w I was checking the you know the amount of compute power in the commercial sector and you know, in a cloud uh, service providers is increasing, right? And I don't have a crystal ball, but you would imagine that the times in which national labs completely dominated HPC mm -hmm. uh, might be uh, passing. Mm -hmm. And there may be serious competitors in terms of HPC in the commercial sector. Mm -hmm. And so do you imagine uh, uh, you know, this is true also for companies. Uh, uh, do, do, what would be required for an organization like a national lab uh, to run maybe the non, the, uh, you know, not super sensitive computing outside in, in cloud resources? And if anyone has some insight from a commercial standpoint, from a company standpoint, uh, what's the, what, what are the barriers to uh, doing some of this computing in the cloud. Well, I think some algorithms are more amenable to cloud computing where you have looser connections between processes, mm -hmm. right? Where they're embarrassingly parallel. And there are other problems like partial solving p systems of partial differential equations mm -hmm. that require much tighter coupling that probably won't happen very well necessarily in the cloud unless they have very fast interconnects. I think they, they are developing yeah. those. And uh, I, said, right. I should say one of the things that has to happen is, you know, even as computing gets faster and faster, a thousand fold every couple of years, the networks also have to increase in speed to accommodate the, the higher yeah, so throughput and bandwidth, right? So right now, things like the energy science network that DOE puts up is maybe a couple hundred gigabits per second mm -hmm. in terms of data transmission within um, a large part of the U.S. into Europe, but I think if as more people hop onto this um, and do computing in the cloud or streaming data, you're going to have traffic in the network that's going to be the bottleneck and not the computing itself. Mm -hmm. And that's so, another opportunity. So that's another infrastructure issue. That's an you know there's an interesting uh, challenge in, for example, in healthcare and like uh, MR and CT reconstruction. You know, people have been talking about using the cloud for years, but the big challenge there is that you have huge data sets that have to be moved around. Right. So there's a big, uh, so there, uh, it, it's sort of moving in that direction. I think that you'll start to see maybe um, not uh, 
you, you know, sort of local servers in hospitals that do that sort of thing so that they get better utilization. The disadvantage of, uh, the, uh, of having embedded computing, high performance embedded computing with each uh, you know, device is that that thing is sitting idle most of the time, right? right. So it's very inefficient. But, but the advantage is that you don't have to move so much data around. And you know, one example of, um, uh, it, it, that you know, has had big impact is on our cell phones with speech recognition, sorry, and, uh, and right. uh, what's the other one, I forget. But anyway, um, the, you know, that's an example sort of a combination of local and server uh, and you know, cloud computing that's enabled a very impactful you know, application. But uh, you know, the challenge there is to balance the amount of communication and also the security issues right, right. of moving. You know, people don't necessarily want their secure data distributed all over the world. So, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's going to be a real challenge. And cost right now, I think, is high. For like, for instance, we've looked at like uh, <laughs> cloud services on Amazon for secure computing. It's very expensive. I think it also opens up the door for lots of interesting, innovative data compression yes, methods. Exactly. Yes. Methods for multi-resolution visualization, for yeah. example, where and reconstruction of data, right? right? Yeah. So that you can ship small packets fast and then right, yeah, absolutely, and, uh, and only the critical information, right? Right. Yeah. Lossy methods, which identify critical right. information and just transfer, right. or for even parameters of it. That's probably interesting because there, you, you need those type of techniques also in leadership type computing mm -hmm. because of you can't the store fact it. that you cannot store it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there's an opportunity there where you can use similar techniques on both ends where you do some local processing to ship the data out, mm -hmm. to do more uh, you know, powerful analysis in the cloud and then right. ship them back in you know, right. post-process. Right. Mm -hmm. Similar to what you do in a leadership type uh, right. environment. Mm -hmm. you know, this communications problem actually brings in also the question of reliability of systems. So if you're looking at millions of processors and your chance of losing a processor is one in a million, right. is it probably going to lose some processors? That's so nice. being able to proceed with a calculation having lost some of it and maybe do some kind of error correction right. to keep up might, uh, might also be a big breakthrough, breakthrough would, would also help with the communication. Right. Mm -hmm. I think along those lines, developing math algorithms that are, that are resilient to yeah, um, right. failure, right, or iterative yeah. methods are yeah. can pick up, can keep progressing when there's errors or asynchronous, you know, methods. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so some combination of local computation, sort of speculatively, and then a correction from the global network of computation. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think we have another question from the audience. A another student, I think. Always a student. Uh, so I was fascinated by the uh, the two bookends that uh, have come up in the discussion. One on the side of uh, uh, accessibility of uh, you know to and pervasive computing and accessibility, and on the other side you're talking of leadership, uh, uh, you know, computational tools. And I couldn't but help think of <coughs> you know the path that most disruptive technologies have followed, and. Uh, one that I've been reading about recently is gene drives, for example. One interesting thing that you see is the development of the uh, what you would call leadership kind of systems, um, really expensive, you know, just hero, you know, heroic computations kind of stuff, is always um, sold based on potential impact to, uh, you know, key really important problems. So gene drives are very much sold as gee, we might be able to create a mosquito uh, that, you know, knocks off all the other mosquitoes that, you know, spread malaria. You know, so there's a grand challenge problem. Everyone gets it. Investment follows. But then as gene drives come, you know, prices come tumbling down, accessibility becomes easier, everyone is able to use them to their locally defined, you know, uh, you know challenges. So uh, it's, it's probably very clear that as high performance computing, uh, whether cloud-based or, uh, you know, otherwise hybrid systems, that it goes down to the hands of users, we'll define our own ways, you know, in different uh, places to, to drive change and transformation. But at the leading edge of it, uh, you know, Exascale, all of you have been in situations talking about it. What are some of those grand challenge impact areas that you think, um, you know, to say something like, hey, we can get rid of malaria, you know, that level of impact, uh, what, what, what can we say in the diff different fields that you're in, some examples of those kind of Impacts. So what, what can we solve at the excess scale that a few petascale systems won't be able to do? 
maybe uh, I'm sure Jackie well, is no, particularly. <laughs> Exascale sounds like a lot, but it's only a thousandfold bigger than petascale. Mm. So <laughs> just to, ca only. to calibrate, yeah. right? It doesn't solve the world's problems. But I think it, what it, in in our field in combustion, what it will do is, like I said before, allow um, us to incorporate couple simulation and experiment to provide as much detailed information in as relevant as possible, you know, practical engineering spaces that can inform industry, um, people designing gas turbines and engines, and, and then maybe through machine learning and other types of methods, provide surrogate models and better modeling that industry can then use to run millions of calculations to help optimize their design of both the fuel and, as well as the combustor. It's interesting. I mean, I, I'm going to actually push back against that hypothesis a little bit, which is that I mean, we tend to want to look for the big application wins, and and they will, and they're very important. But sometimes, what really has impact is just making something simple more efficient. Like, um, and uh, I think you know, the CPU was a huge uh, revolution in computing because it's sort of a commoditized computation, right? We took a lot of complicated flip-flops and gates and so forth, the bit slice processors, and we said, okay, we're going to have this single generic CPU with a defined instruction set, and we'll just keep making it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and so more and more people ha have it. But a similar thing happened with um, uh, machine learning. One of the reasons I think it's so hot right now is it, a lot of the technologies existed for quite a while, but they just took some of it, they took a few key modules that were well understood, and they made them really efficient and fast and cheap and easy to use, okay? So I kind of think with high performance computing, maybe what needs to be done is identify a few core operations that are sort of very commoditized and easy to use, and then they could be sort of democratized across a lot of applications, and then we find out what the big wins were when people tried a lot of different things. So it's hard to say. I'm not saying that that's right, but it's not necessarily wrong. So along those lines, I was going to say, um, using these hero machines with different types of heterogeneous processors, tensor, pro uh, tensor processing units, right. GPUs, CPUs, yeah. what we're seeing more of at these large scale runs is combining physics runs with machine learning mm -hmm. in situ, where you devote the tensor processing units maybe right. to convolutional neural networks, yeah. and then you use, you know, do your PDE solves on, on um, the CPUs and maybe chemistry solves on the GPUs. And so, mm -hmm. as I think you said, pointed out earlier, you know, we're only using a, f a fraction of the ma machine to do the actual science solve, and there's all this extra real estate on the machine to, to do these analytics and machine learning types of things and couple them together. And so, to, to couple it together effectively, you need to have a runtime or a, a programming model that, that kind of sees, sits on top of all of it and kind of can orchestrate holistically the data movement and which resources different computations should be computed on yeah, dynamically. I, I totally agree and, with that. And even having that kind of uh, software stack and runtime system, I think at the bleeding edge will trickle down to, okay. well, this is a forecast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it will. Right? To more common things that we're all going to be doing, right? Yeah, yeah. And trying it, to grapple it, it, with. As Arvind was saying, I think this does trickle down and changes the way people do things, right? Doing data-centric computing, um, you know, maybe, maybe M I, I don't like to bash MPI, but <laughs> you know, but it sits at a low level, and maybe it's seen its better days given the yeah. changes in hardware and and the y use modes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, another question from a student. The, the panelists <laughs> could comment on two phrases: analog computing one phrase, uh, and also comment on another phrase, artificial intelligence. Mm. Okay, so, so we've talked a little bit about artificial intelligence with, with Charlie, and maybe we can discuss a little bit uh, neural uh, computing, you know, neural uh, processing mm. units that are um, analog, and uh, they're, they're used, you know, they're on, on devices today to do parts of the computing. Yeah, no, it's it's really hard to say. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I started my career at Lincoln Lab working in an analog signal processing group that were using surface acoustic wave devices and uh, and solfets and 
and, and, and that, but then what happened is that the wave kind of pendulum swung, and people said, oh gosh, you know, you want to digitize things as close to the sensor as possible and process everything digitally because speeds were so much higher and it's so much easier to program than it is to try to design a hardware device. But, you know, maybe that's going to swing back. Um, although, if it does, I mean, we really we need to define where, very well-defined modules, in my opinion, that for which you would be able to plug in that analog computing. And there has to be a big win because the complexity of it is high. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, as far as AI goes, the, um, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we have this huge uh, 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 burgeoning interest in AI, and I think that's a great thing. But really, most of it comes down to machine learning. Uh, there is, there's an alternative argument to make, which is that we're just at the we're just scratching the surface of AI. We've now, okay, these really hard problems like object recognition that we thought, oh, if we could finally crack that, the AI would be so much easier. But then, so we cracked that problem, but now we realize, gee, okay, so we can recognize objects in a room, but how do we make decisions about how to do things and that, like humans do? And we suddenly realized once again that there's a huge number of problems in artificial intelligence that we have no idea how to do. So I think uh, that we had a big breakthrough, but I think um, we're just starting a journey. Excellent. So, so maybe uh, as a final theme, uh, we're at, at a university, Purdue's a big, large university. We educate a lot of students. We'd like to reach out to more uh, students and, and uh, certainly all our alums. How, what are the implications uh, in terms of education, what are the implications in not just in, the, in, in educating next generation of students? How can we use this technology to make education better? And what do we need to teach our students? Well, I think we should fully Jump, yes. integrate um, large scale computing into the curriculum. So the student who's going to school now will probably, even if a non specialist, will encounter large scale computing in the work environment when that person gets out. And so we need to develop that set of skills um, to sensibly use, use large-scale computing when they get out. And I'd, I'd like to add, you know, again, it's devil's advocate, most large-scale computing is used very badly. So if you look at the queue on a large-scale supercomputer, there are a lot of small jobs running it at one time. That's a total waste of money and electricity. They should be running very large problems. So using, learning to use these kind of resources sensibly should be part of the curriculum. And the point I would make, and, and again, to be a, a bit controversial, I remember a, a, a colleague of mine saying, um, I'm not going to mention who, who it was, um, saying, well, we, you know, we're trying to teach these students uh, you know, computational physics, and um, when we opened an X term, uh, they, they were all surprised, and they didn't know what to do with an X term. And maybe we shouldn't open an X term to begin <laughs> with, right? Uh, it, it's, maybe we need to think about using better tools uh, to uh, you know, and educate students with more modern tools and not the way we used to do computational science in the 70s, right? Creating directories by hand and VI and all that. And I love that. That's how I do it. But I don't think our, our students should do it the same way I did it. But I think there's a preliminary step to be taken. Um, sometimes we as instructors have uh, the push from above to, for example, train students on commercial software or have them be end users of software, right? That is, at, whereas I would, have te I would like to teach coding as soon as possible. And, and even Python, why, Python is, is like reading a book sometimes, right? So we start with high level languages, mm -hmm. right? And then we, after they digest and understand high level languages, we go to low level languages, and then we can talk about high performance computing. But we're missing that preliminary step, I believe, to, to train the students. Sometimes, Coding is considered a taboo, right? They don't, there should be, I think every degree should have uh, a computer science class, a hardcore computer science class as early as possible. And I think some degrees are still lacking that. So I would argue that we need a step before I that. I certainly think not every degree has to have a hardcore computer science Why not? class. Why not? Because I, I, we don't, we, we can use these tools without having a computer science. I, I think you're programming to some degree um, an introductory programming course is, is interesting. I don't know that, I don't think that everyone, every engineer needs to be uh, a programmer. They certainly need to be a good 
expert user of the codes, like finite elements, you know, if you're a mechanical engineer, you have to know how to program a, a you know, sophisticated code. But programming is not the same thing as computing. It could be something else. There's folks in humanities that, that there's programs that uh, combine programming and algorithmic development with, with humanitarian studies or humanities. And so I think we can treat a coding education as a more broad Coding education. Coding education. Yeah. Before high performance computing, I guess. But something maybe that universities are missing or to put them in large scale, massively parallel uh, computations. There are courses, of course, offered, but it's not basically yeah. very uh, directed uh, curriculum, and uh, including uh, these uh, advanced computing courses, data analysis, and all of those in sequence where students get the training to get there to um, have the knowledge needed um, for doing exa uh, scale computing becomes very important. It doesn't mean necessarily that everyone needs to take those uh, courses. I think, Kami, as part of that course, developing in the, stu the student to have good software engineering practices also, right? Yeah. Regression testing, um, code repositories, and nothing can replace actually hands-on writing code as pr you know, mini projects to, to actually do it in practice to get better. <laughs> so as a consumer of our products, you hire a lot of uh, PhDs, right, in, in your group over the years, how do, do you see a, a difference in the, in the knowledge, in the type of education that our students have over the, over the years? Do you see a, an evolution of the type of background that then your staff members, when they join Sandia, have? Do you well, I, I look to students in that um, have a lot of um, interest in both the physical sciences as well as in computer science and computational science and algorithms. So they kind of have, a lot of them are hackers to begin with <laughs> and happen to like physical sciences too. Um, so is it so harder, harder to find It's hard to find people the, like that with dual, do, dual legs. Dual legs. Um, you know, there are a number of universities that teach that kind of mixed curriculum. And so, for example, at, at UT Austin has a very strong program in computational sciences in Utah, and there's a couple other mm -hmm. places. Yeah. And where the students have exposure to computer science, applied math, and the physical sciences, right. and not just a, st a stovepiped education. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just ha I, this has been a fascinating discussion, but I just have to come back down on the side of teaching the students computing. And I, I would say, really, at the risk of being controversial, all engineering students should learn to program. It, it was interesting, like 25 years ago, there was a big swing in the pendulum where people were saying, well, electrical engineers really shouldn't know how to program. It's not necessary it's because there'll be, you know, there'll be some sort of point and click environment where they do this. And it's gone exactly the opposite way. More and more companies and employers are just really want students to be able to program because that's how you actually implement your ideas. So, um, and they want them to have good coding skills. I, I agree with that. What I meant is that we don't want, we don't oh. necessarily need all the students to do exact scale computing. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I took yours to be in line with my view, actually. Exascale yeah. or, or yeah. computer science. Yeah. Right. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I totally agree, yeah. But, but I don't think the coding education should be bypassed for user-friendly exascale uh, tool that maybe we can train them on. Should, I think they should know what's under the hood. 